we're just uh, we're just running the presentation off a different computer. So okay, we're off. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about faces and brains today. Now, the face. Um, could I get a mirror of the presentation down on the screen, please? Okay, I'll just look to the screen. Okay, so basically, the face is our primary means of communication and expression. Faces give us our identity. Our faces give us our identity. Uh, basically, they express our internal state and they show our intent. Now, the face is also the mirror of the brain. I see also the face as an instrument. And what we're doing is we're building a synthesizer. So we're putting together models of brains and models of faces to basically create autonomous animation. That's animation which animates itself. Now, this gives an idea of the sort of systems that we're building. This is an artificial nervous system. So basically, we're constrained by our senses, how we experience the world. We have eyes which get electromagnetic radiation, ears which pick up vibrations. And, but they, they could be signals from anywhere. It could be the stock market, it could be a temperature sensor. And our brain basically does multimodal association with that, and then it combines it with our emotion, it basically evaluates it emotionally or motivationally to create action. Now in robotics, that creates movements and things, but one big area which really hasn't been paid a lot of attention to is how that can be expressed. How do you express what the machine is actually thinking? So we can do this with facial expression, or we can also do this with, it could be music or colour. Now, to do this, we're basically creating live neurobehavioural models. So we're doing models of the brain with models of the face so that we can actually embody some of theoretical neuroscience models in a computing thing which can sense the world. So why do this? There's lots of reasons. The primary reason is really it's understanding our nature. It's really exploring the deepest aspects of ourselves. How do we learn anything? Another reason is that there's increasing human-machine interaction, so we just have to get used to these things. And what's the most natural way to do this? Now, biophilia, people basically like living things. We pay more attention to living things than non-living things. Anthropomorphic communication is when we basically understand the actions of an inanimate object as if it was a thinking agent. For example, when a car indicates Basically, it's like somebody winking or whatever. They're giving you a direction that they're going to go in, so you infer a sense of intent or so that. Now, the face has actually got over 40 channels, 40 different muscles, 40 plus muscles that it can actually move to give you information. So it can pretty much um, convey so much information which we're not really taking advantage of. Now, Baxter is an example of a robot where they put a face on it. And the reason for the face on the robot is because the face will look where it's about to move the arm. It gives away the intent of the robot. So somebody will stand out of the way and not be hit by the robotic arm. So that's a very good example of why it's important to understand what a machine might want to do, because they're not always right. Now, the other reason for building these sorts of nervous systems is utility. We can combine any kind of sort of computational intelligence or machine learning thing into the system and do some very interesting things with it and useful things. You can also be very creative with it because you can sort of get in there at any part of that pipeline and do things. Now, I've spent a lot of time working on computer-generated faces for movies like Spider-Man 2, King Kong, and Avatar. And I've been making digital humans for about 15 years. Uh, this is an example of uh, one which we did about 14 years ago, which was um, about 10 years before Benjamin Button, but we were digitally aging the character. Now the point of this was basically to see if we could come across with a computer character giving a state of sort of internal thought. It was introspecting. Uh, is the audience sort of taken to a place where they're thinking about that character's thoughts rather than thinking about the artifice? Now, if I change the face, I'll show you the importance of the face in any sort of picture. We'll do a slight change to this face and see how this basically influences the, the context. <laughs> so basically, how do you classify? So faces are very, very important. You've got to get them right. Now, how do you classify what a face does? They do all these wonderful, wonderful things. And what's, what's really the information that the face is giving out? What is the fundamental basis of the information? And on a biological basis, 
it's activity going to the muscles which are driving the facial expression. In the 1970s, the psychologist Paul Ekman basically started exploring universals of facial expression by putting non-emotional non terms to the actions of the face. So these will be groups of muscle actions. Now if we put a few of these together, here's examples of different things you can do if your face moving muscles. And now, if we want to build up a smile, it's two numbers. If you want to build up an angry expression, so it takes more energy to be angry than it does to smile, so be lazy and smile. So we've been also working on basically making a universal system for building faces. So we want to look at what nature does. And so we've gone to all kinds of crazy lengths for this. Um, I went in an MRI machine and held a smile for 15 minutes to look at what was going on. This is an ultrasound system that we developed, which is basically looking at what's going on underneath the skin during a smile. But we put these together and we can start building a mathematical model of the human face. So what you're looking at here is a mathematical simulation. The only thing which doesn't actually do anything in the simulation are the blood vessels. Everything else is part of a computational simulation. It's my face because I was a guinea pig in, in the experiment. But now what happens is we activate these muscles by basically digitally activating the muscle. And the face makes an expression. Now this is happening. It's not being sculpted that way. It actually creates that. Now if we randomly activate the muscles in the physics simulation, we look at how the lips and things collide, how things slide over the, over the bone and so forth. And so that's a bit of background. But the thing that I got really interested in was the control system for these muscles. How does the brain control the face? So what we started looking into was basically nerve animation. Can we animate the nerves which animate the, the muscles of the face which give you an expression that you emotionally respond to? Now to do this, I set up a new lab. This is at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And the mission of the lab is basically combining models of the face and models of the brain to start sort of building these, these core sort of models of, of human behavior. Now, we use brain-based computing to drive the models because we want to make them biologically based. Biologically, essentially, behavior is biological at its core. And so we want to use biological models to understand these and drive these. So we build models of emotion and motivation. This is all based on, on the scientific research. And we, this includes models of learning, which is absolutely fundamental. And basically what, what we create is a sort of like a, um, a neural dynamics, if you like, a neural systems dynamics. And you can think about um, people's performances and their characters almost like a weather system. It's never completely predictable, but there's stable patterns. Now we might have a, the equivalent of a climate, could be somebody's personality. Now, from an engineering point of view, you can kind of approach the brain in a modular fashion. We can also constrain what the what, how this works by looking at the anatomical pathways of how the brain actually controls the face. We can also look at how decisions are made in the brain. This is an example of part of the brain called the basal ganglia. If I want to move my arm from here to here, there's a hundred ways that I could have done that, but my brain chooses one. We also want to build in emotional systems into the, into the model. Now, emotions are not just in the brain, they're also in the, in, the, um, in the body. And so we have to combine these things. So with these models, we basically also make build them self-organizing. So they, they can actually kind of just create from experience, basically. I'll skip through a few slides, but basically lots of interesting computational neurosciences models have been researched. But what if we put some of these together and start embodying them? And so to do that, it's very complicated. So to do that, we've basically built like a Lego system so that we can build systems of basically a system for building systems, which we're calling brain language. Now, to give an example of this in action, we're building, basically applying it to a baby. We're starting off at the simplest point. So here's a real baby. This is captured in stereo. Now, and here's the baby having solid food for the very first time in its life. It's a fundamentally new experience. <laughs> now, what happens if a computer or a machine reacts like that when it learns something new? You start to associate, you start to identify with it. Now, here's basically building up a 3D 
model, so we're scanning the baby, then we're building up a biomechanical model of the baby. We activate the muscle, oh, I'll go back to that one. Anyway, we basically, oh, here we go, we activate the muscles of the baby. Now, you can't get real babies to do what you want, but you can simulate them. And now we start putting in the brain systems which are driving the, the baby's model. So these are building models, the neural systems models, of how the brain is controlling the face. And we put all the pieces together. And what you're going to see now is um, Baby X version 3. Um, version 2 was unveiled at TEDx in Auckland last year. So this is number 3, so nobody's really seen this yet. So here we go. This is Baby X, you different things. So she's running real time on the computer. Can you turn up the volume, please? Noises like. Okay, she can hear noises. She's constantly listening. And you can. She's listening to us all the time, and kind of see how she's kind of responding to facial expressions here. So she's she's watching what I'm doing. If I leave the room, she's probably get a bit upset. So she's got neuromodulators modelled in this, so her oxytocin level is dropping, she's been abandoned, and her cortisol levels are going to start to rise. It's wondering where I've gone. It's getting upset. And I come back, it's okay. It's okay, baby. It's, yeah, it's okay. So he's back. Now, here's, here's a, you've heard of You've heard of um, Pav Pavlov's dog, so this is the same sort of thing. So we, we missed that bit of it, but basically I'm pairing the sound of a bell with a positive experience. That's right. That noise means happiness. That's right. That's right. So now... Now when she hears the bell, she gets happy. So this could be anything. This is like one of, this is basically one of the standard conditions. And what we're looking at here is the basis of empathy. So this is how babies and their caregivers interact. A baby will do something, the caregiver will mimic the action, and the baby starts associating that. Good girl. Good girl, yeah. Now what's happened is she's out, after a while, she's now learnt it. You ready? And now, now I do the action, and now she's copying it. It started the other way around. Now we basically put a, the video game Pong in her visual field and now she's kind of learning to play it. And this is like the talks before, you know. She's not very good, she starts off missing things. She doesn't even know she can control the bat. She doesn't realise she's got mind control over the bat. So, but basically she gets better at it. She starts actually realising that she can move the bat and getting a reward. And this is just how babies learn. They, they babble, they flail their arms around and they might hit a rat or something. Now, what we're looking at here is what's driving, this is running live behind the baby's face. So you're actually looking at all the neural network models which are driving the model live. Now, they're put in the appropriate places in, in the, in the, um, on the appropriate neuroanatomy. So we're looking at the different circuits driving the oculomotor system, the basal ganglia, cortex areas, and we can spin around this model. This is all running live in real time. So it's basically watching, watching us as it's doing this. So you can see the sort of what's going on in the visual cortex. And now we're going to um, go into part of the brain stem. This, in the center area there, there's a, a part of the brain called the superoculiculus, which is what controls your attention. It's where you kind of map the world onto your body in a way. And so there's a neural field there, and the winner of that is what, where you look. That's where it directs your eyes. Now if you look closely into the eyes, you can actually see um, me reflected in it, because we're, it's, this is what it's seeing outside. And what we're looking at here is a corticothalamic loop, which is going through the basal ganglia. So your cortex basically decides that it wants to do something. It goes down through the basal ganglia, which either reinforces it or shuts it down. It's either a good idea or a bad idea. And then if this positive reinforcement gets built up, it results in an action. If it's negative, it basically shuts it down. So this is, one, this is a sort of one of the basis of reinforcement learning. We're going for time. So you can see the circuit's kind of in action, and we can change the amount of dopamine in the system. So all the yeah, physiological. Yes. yes, that's right. Very good. Yeah. 
And this is vocal babbling. So this is one of the basis of learning behavior. That's right. Now, this is what the baby actually remembers too. This is, I took it to my daughter's school and it's kind of looking at what the kids say. So this is kind of getting a, a, a window into what the machine sees. Now, we can also put it on characters. Same sort of thing, this little thing is gonna, but it's all the same sort of idea that you can express the internal state in any sort of way. Now, and we can also make um, realistic characters. We're building a face simulator. So here's an example of a model that we're building at the moment. So basically, the idea with this is that we can make these very, very realistic models. This is for psychology research and all kinds of other use, but that we can apply to different things. So I'll skip through this, and I think I'm out of time, but I just want to thank my team, who are fantastic, and um, thank you.